Oh, hey. <laughs> Yummy. Thank you. Thanks, Aves. That was so good. You know, all those years, 25 years of doing the Oprah show and going into work at 5.30 in the morning in the makeup chair by 6.30 and literally crawling home at night for 25 years, I used to wonder what the ladies who lunch were doing. <laughs> really, I was attracted to like uh, paintings of women lunching and, and uh, so this is what it's like. I, but even better, this is an empowerment lunch. You know, I, I changed how I viewed power about uh, 1989. There was a book I read by uh, a man named Gary Zukov called Seat of the Soul. And in Seat of the Soul, he defined what is true power, what is authentic power. And, and his definition of authentic power, meaning the kind of power that can never be taken from you, not your looks, not your fame, not your money, not your square footage, but authentic power is when the personality, your personality, comes to serve the energy of your soul. When you are able to align who you are, who you've become in the world, with really what you've come to do in the world, when your personality serves the soul. So I thought a lot about that. That book was actually life-changing for me. And I was building a home in Santa Barbara and as anybody who's ever built a bathroom or a home or anything, nothing ever happens on time. And it was 2002 and we're supposed to be finished and it wasn't finished and I was like, I can't wait to get in my house and I'm finally gonna have a great Christmas and I'm gonna do the kind of Christmas that I dreamed of from the Courier and Ives you know, cards. So I'm gonna have the reeds on the door and, but I didn't have a floor so it's a little difficult to do that. So I started to think, if I can't do that Christmas, well, what, what am I gonna do for Christmas? My house isn't even ready, and what can I do? So I started, as I was walking around through the trees, sitting under that tree, because my favorite time is to be alone with my thoughts. And as I was alone with my thoughts, I was thinking, what would be the next best possible Christmas for myself? And I thought of the best Christmas I ever had. The best Christmas I ever had was when I was 12 years old. My mother was on welfare. I was living with my mother and a half brother and sister in Milwaukee. And my mother called me, the oldest, to say, into a room to say, we won't be having Christmas this year. I said, we won't be having Christmas. What about Santa Claus? There is no Santa Claus. I had already figured that out, but okay. I was embarrassed and I was ashamed because for the first time, I had to face the reality that, yeah, what I've been suspecting, that we're not like the other kids, that we really are poor, is true. So we're not gonna have Christmas and there is no Santa Claus. My first thought after being embarrassed and ashamed was what will my story be? What am I gonna tell everybody when we go back to school and they're showing their toys and I don't have anything to talk about. What am I going to do? I'm not going to go outside tomorrow when everybody's out in the yards, in their yards, showing the toys they got for Christmas. I'm going to stay inside. Am I going to pretend I'm sick? What, am, what is my story going to be? Well, late that night, some nuns showed up at our house, and they brought a basket of um, food, and they brought toys for my, uh, my brother and my sister. And I was overwhelmed with joy that those nuns showed up. Not because they brought me a Tammy doll when I really wanted a Barbie doll. <laughs> I was overwhelmed because somebody remembered that we existed and somebody cared enough in the middle of the night to come to our house with food and toys. And also I would now have a story. 
So as I was contemplating, what is the, that was the best Christmas I ever had. I thought, how could I make that possible for somebody else? What could I do to create the same kind of experience for other children? So I took 50 members of my team at Harpo, Harriet, one of them, Sherry, the table, and hired another 50 people in South Africa. And we went to South Africa with the idea of creating something that we ended up doing a documentary about called Christmas Kindness. Christmas Kindness, using my personality to serve the energy of my soul. So we went from village to village offering toys and clothes, food, soccer, boy, soccer balls to children who'd never experienced Christmas before. And early in the morning, you could see them lining up by the thousands to come. And we actually went to 10 or 12 villages to do this. And people said to me at the time, oh, that's so frivolous, and the kids won't remember it, and why don't you use your money to do something else, more substantial, Oprah? And I said, they may not remember the toy. They may not remember the clothes, although they were most excited, the children, to open boxes uh, containing clothes because, um, as their caretaker said to us, having new clothes made them not feel poor. And for so many of these kids, it was the first time they'd ever experienced having something that was new for them. They may not remember what they got in the box, but they will remember that somebody remembered them. They will remember the experience. So during this entire experience, Nelson Mandela had invited uh, Stedman and I to stay at his home. So when Nelson Mandela invites you, you stay. And I was so nervous. I was like, oh my God, what am I gonna talk to? Because it's 10 days. It's 10 days, it's not just a dinner, it's not a lunch, it's 10 days. It's 10 days, breakfast, lunch, and dinner with Nelson Mandela, what am I gonna say? Stedman said, why don't you try listening? <laughs> so I did. I had 29 meals with Nelson Mandela. At first, really, 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 I was very, you know, like, oh my God, it's Nelson Mandela. And by the third or fourth day, he and I would sit together in his um, living room, sharing the paper at the end of the day, talking about events in the world. And one of the things we came to talk about the most was the power of education to overcome poverty. So in one of those, lucid moments, I said to him, well, you know, I've always wanted to build a school. He said, you want to build a school? Oprah, you want to build a school? So he got up and made a phone call to the Minister of Education. Well, I wasn't planning on building it then. <laughs> but all right. Um, the Minister of Education comes over later in the day and we start the process of, of, of building a school. The reason why I wanted to build a school, because I tried different things, because I always knew, even before I could articulate, that my personality needs to serve my soul. I always knew that to whom much is given, as the Bible says, much is expected, much is not just expected, much is required. So from the first time I came to Chicago and started to make um, more money than I needed to actually pay my bills. I reached out and was going to form a, 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 a sister group trying to help young girls in the project. And I discovered I wasn't able to do what I really needed to change the trajectory of those girls' lives because every girl that we would take out of the project and spend time with on the weekends, my producers and I, they would have to go back home into the same environment and it was impossible to just change the way they saw themselves in the world. So by trial and error, I knew that in order to literally change the way a girl sees herself, I would need enough time um, to spend with her, uh, to be able to hire the right kind of teachers, the right kind of administration, to be surrounded by a nurturing, envi nurturing environment, to allow that girl to change the way she felt about herself and saw herself in the world. So the idea of creating a boarding school that 
was surrounded by beauty, the kind of school that I would want to go to. And I tell you, when I first sat down with the architects and said, I want to build a great school, a great school for leaders that will change the lives of women and they will be able to break the cycle of poverty for themselves and their families forever and become a part of the real and true new and free South Africa. Well, the architect said to me, well, these are poor girls. These girls, these girls. I said, well, where are the closets? Where are the, where's the space? Where's the drama? Where's the theater? And they said, well, these are poor girls. These girls really don't come from families with clothes and a lot of them have lost their families. And I said, but they will have clothes and they will be able to do drama and they will be able to excel beyond anybody's dreams. And that is exactly what has happened five years later. Um, as Ava mentioned, as Ava mentioned, we are now approaching, I'll go over at the end of November and we have our fifth graduating class. Um, this coming uh, June, I'll have 43 girls graduating in South Africa. I have seven in the United States graduating. I have 20 girls in the United States. One of them, Shade, is here today. Um, stand up, Shade. Say hi. This young woman who's now a junior at Stanford. Um, I met when she was 12 years old, and uh, I did the interview and said, tell me why you want to come, do you want to come to this school? And she says, I really want to come. I really, really want to come. A dozen reallys. And, uh, and she has done magnificent work throughout seventh grade, eighth grade, 10th grade, 12th grade. And from the moment um, my goddaughter, Kirby, who's also here today, who's Gail's daughter, uh, came to speak to the girls at the school. Kirby was attending Stanford, and from the moment Shade heard Kirby speak about Stanford, uh, she said that she knew that those were her people. And so <laughs> when we went to Stanford and looked at the campus, she said, Mamo, these are my peeps, these are my peeps. So this is what I know, that being here today and hearing from Susan and Gwyneth and Selma and Rebecca and Jim and Anna and all of us, it's a really good thing. But I have always known this about celebrity. The real power of being somebody that somebody knows, and I really think that the only difference between being famous and not is that more people know your name. So the only difference between understanding that is understanding that what Selma has done, what Susan has done, what Anna has done, Rebecca has done, what Jim has done, what I've done, you too can do. Because true philanthropy comes from living from the heart of yourself and giving what you have been given. How will you do that? How will you use your personality, the energy of your personality to serve that which is your soul's calling. I know this for sure. Any life, no matter how fantastic it is, how glorious it seems, how much attention you receive, how much square footage you have, any life and every life is enhanced by the sharing and the giving and the opening up of the heart space. Your life gets better when you can find a way to share it with someone else. So what we've done, you can do. The real empowerment comes when every person leaves this room and makes a decision, makes a decision. Maybe that decision is that you will write a check and support some of the wonderful organizations you've heard here today. But the true decision is how will you use yourself? How will you use everything that you have been given to serve that which is greater than yourself? How will you use that to become truly, authentically empowered? Now, it is a beautiful thing to receive an award and to be on the cover of Variety. Thank you very much. It's a beautiful thing. But the true reward is in the lives that you are able to touch and the people who you know you have impacted. Um, my beloved mentor, teacher, friend, mother, 
Maya Angelou passed away last year. And I remember when I opened the school, I was so happy that finally it happened. We got it done and went, got through all the bureaucracy and all the stuff that it takes to build a school from the ground up. And I said to Maya, oh my God, Maya, this is going to be my, this is going, this is my legacy. And Maya said, you have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea what your legacy is. Your legacy is every life you have touched. Your legacy is every person you have met whose influence was felt by you. Every single person. So she said, it's every person who's ever watched a show and decided that they were gonna go back to school or watched a show and decided that I'm gonna leave my husband. I'm going to not, no longer be a victim of abuse. Every person who watched a show and said, I am a victim of abuse, and because I saw this, I now can stand up for myself. Every person who gained a voice because of you, you have no idea what your legacy is. Your legacy is every life that you touch. And so, as you leave here today, the decision is, whose lives will that be? How will you use yourself in such a way that your impact and your legacy will live beyond the doing. So the great reward for me is knowing that what I'm doing and, and how I've done it and how I choose to live in the space that I call God, how in God I move and breathe and have my being and I try to move from the center of that, is able to literally touch the lives of other people. Uh, I said to the girls when they first came to the school, we found them in villages and we found them in townships. We went out, some kids were having school in a boxcar on a railroad track and some under a tree. And I said to the girls, the trajectory of your life is about to change. And I only ask one thing of you, is that you give as much of yourself as I and this school is willing to give to you. And Becky Sykes, who's the head of our foundation, spends so much, stand up, Becky. <laughs> spends so much time with the girls, can vouch for this. And so this is the true reward. I just wanted to share this with you. One of my, Shade is here because she's the only one of the 20 girls who are in school in the United States, uh, in school from, their girls range from Brown, Mount Holyoke, Wellesley, Johnson C. Smith, Spel Spellman, Colorado, Oregon, Stanford. She's the only one who had Fridays off. So <laughs> I said, everybody, mm -mm, I get out of class to come to Variety, no. <laughs> but um, June of this year, I mean, so the girls are out in the world. We've done this thing that Susan was talking about, uh, touching the lives of girls. And when you, when you, when you change a girl's life, you don't just change a girl's life, you change the community's life, you change a family's life. Because what girls do is they take it back home, they take it to their families, they take it to their communities. So uh, my girls are all over the country in internships and working and doing multiple things uh, during the summer months. And one of my daughters, I call them my daughters, uh, Avakile, who's at Colorado College, was working in, went back to Cape Town to work in Cape Town this summer. And uh, she'd always wanted to be a doctor, had planned to major in medicine, and this summer made the decision that she was gonna switch to public health. So when they leave, I always say, just, just, keep in, just let me know, just send a text. You don't even have to say you arrived, just send an emoji. Emoji, hello, I'm here. Uh, but she wrote me this amazing letter that will be something I treasure forever. I just wanted to share a bit of it with you today. She wrote this on uh, June 11th, after having arrived in Cape Town and um, being in a house with all of these students from different parts of the world. She writes, this is a girl who we found who would have had a very different life. But she writes, the other day, we were all sitting around table and began to have a heated, passionate, respectful, 
and compassionate, and most important, fulfill, fulfilling discussion about what we want our own country and our nation to be, what we should be doing as the youth of this country to make it better. For the first time, I really believe I have hope for a better future. We talked about what male privilege means, what white privilege means, and the chains of victimization. Oh my mamo. It was challenging, yet so insightful. It felt good to know that I could share my opinion with a group of only guys and know that if my opinion was disagreed upon, it was solely because of the quality of my opinion and not because I'm a girl. I'm finding myself being able to let go and be me without fear of what the next person thinks. When I think I can go deep with someone I do, and most of the time it turns out that person was also seeking the same thing. I'm learning, I'm making mistakes, I'm laughing, I'm deciding, I'm asking, and I'm questioning, and I'm also growing. And I have to tell you, I am filled with gratitude, so much gratitude that I can see the sights that I can see and meet the people I have met and continued to be favored by God. That's the true reward. Thank you.